Alcohols are very versatile in their chemistry and transformations. They can undergo dehydration, oxidation, acid-base chemistry, or transformations into other functional groups and other interconversions. In this tutorial, I want to address one of those functional group transformations, namely the conversion of alcohols into alkyl halides. Hey everyone, Victor is here, your guide to all things organic chemistry. And when it comes to conversion of alcohols to alkyl halides, I often hear the same question. Why do we care about this reaction at all? Well, grab your cup of coffee and notebook to work through the examples with me, hit that like button for good luck on the test, and let's dive in. Well, we know that the OH is a bad leaving group, so sometimes it is a convenient switch if we want to replace an alcohol with something else in a substitution reaction. Or maybe we want to do an elimination reaction and performing the elimination with the alcohol itself is just not feasible, who knows? The point is, the more functional group transformations we have in our toolbox, the easier it is for us to uh, accomplish various synthesis, and having options is always a good idea. I doubt you would be happy to go into a diner with only two options on the menu and nothing but a three-day-old coffee to wash it down with. So same deal we have with organic chemistry. The more transformations we have, the easier it is going to be for us to accomplish different transformations. Now, when it comes to conversion of alcohols into the corresponding alkyl halides, we'll be looking at some sort of a substitution reaction. And as substitution reactions go, we will have either an SN1 reaction or an SN2 reaction style. So let's start by looking at the SN1 reactions first. When alcohols react with hydrogen halides like HCl, HBr, HI, they typically undergo an SN1 reaction yielding the corresponding alkyl halides as products. For instance, in this reaction, I am reacting a 2-methylbutane-2-ol with hydrogen bromide. In this case, we'll make 2-bromomethylbutane as our product. Mechanistically speaking, this reaction will start with the protonation of the OH group, turning it into a good living group. Then, once the living group dissociates, we are going to make a corresponding carbocation, a tertiary carbocation in this case. Next. Since we do not expect any carbocation rearrangements in this particular case, the bromide anion can attack the carbocation, giving us the final product. And as I've mentioned a second ago, SN1 reactions form carbocations. And because of that, we need to be very careful with possible carbocation rearrangements. Remember that if a carbocation rearrangement can give you a more stable carbocation, it will happen before the nucleophilic attack. Which means that every time we make a carbocation as our intermediate, we always have to check for possible rearrangements. This should be your immediate red flag. I see a carbocation, I check for a possible rearrangement. So if I take this secondary alcohol over here and react it with, say, I don't know, HI, for instance, I will end up with the rearranged product, and my iodine will be on a different atom from where the OH group used to be. Let's look at the mechanism here, so we can see exactly how that happened. First, we are going to protonate the OH group, making it into a good living group. Then, we'll have the living group dissociation, yielding a corresponding carbocation. Now, this carbocation is secondary, and it's right next to a quaternary carbon. This means that we can perform an alkyl shift and make a more stable carbocation. The methyl shift here makes a new tertiary carbocation. Now, since my carbocation is as stable as it can possibly be in this particular case, I will proceed with a nucleophilic attack, and once the iodine attacks the carbocation, we'll end up with a final product like that. I do have a whole tutorial on the carbocations and carbocation rearrangements, so if you do feel like you need a refresher, I'll leave the link in the description below. Now, what are we going to do if we don't want a carbocation rearrangement? Or what if I have a primary alcohol and that just won't be able to make a carbocation to begin with, making the SN1 pathway quite problematic? Well, in this case, we're going to use a milder and more controlled SN2 conversion method. There are many different versions of the SN2 style reactions that convert alcohols into corresponding alkyl halides. But despite the variability of methods and different reagents, they all boil down to the same simple strategy. First, 
we convert the OH into a good leaving group, this is typically done in C2, and then, second, we perform the SN2 attack to get the target halide. In this tutorial, I'll go over one of those reagents, which is probably going to be the most common one that you are going to be seeing in your class, which is the PBR3, phosphorus tribromide, in pyridine as a solvent, but you may also encounter phosphorus trichloride or phosphorus pentahalides like phosphorus pentabromide or pentachloride or even a thionyl chloride and many many other reagents. Ultimately, it's up to your instructor and the textbook that you're using in your class which of those reagents you'll cover in your course. The PBR3, however, is a classic and you will definitely see that one in your class. So if I take the same starting material as in my last example and I treat that with PBR3 and pyridine, I'm going to make a corresponding bromide, but now we're not going to see any carbocation rearrangements. Mechanistically speaking, this reaction starts from the nucleophilic attack from the alcohol onto the phosphorus tribromide. This gives us the protonated intermediate, which quickly loses the proton to pyridine. Now we have an excellent leaving group and the bromide anion can attack our molecule, replacing the leaving group, giving us the final product. This is a simplification of the actual mechanism. In reality, experimental data suggests that pyridine here is a bit more proactive than just, you know, a basic solvent and a way to deprotonate our intermediate, but this is the way this mechanism is typically shown uh, in the just a regular sophomore class and in your textbook, so I'll just stick to this version here. Also remember that since this is the SN2 style reaction, you'll have an inversion of the stereochemistry at the alcohol position if it is chiral, of course. So for instance, if I treat the S-butane to all with PBR3 and pyridine, I will get the R 2 bromobutane write down the mechanism for this reaction and make sure you understand how this happened and where exactly we saw the inversion of the stereo configuration. Now, why do we care so much about the stereochemistry? Well, if you are planning your synthesis and you need to have a specific stereochemistry of the final product, then knowing whether the reaction is going to retain the configuration, or invert the configuration, or maybe even scramble it, making it a racemic mixture, will be extremely important to you. If I took the same as butane to all and treated it with HBr instead, this reaction would be in the SN1 conditions and I will end up with the racemic mixture instead of the enantiomerically pure final product, which may or may not be a problem depending on your needs, of course. So as you can see, you can convert alcohols into alkyl halides using several different methods. And if you don't care about the stereochemistry uh, or the carbocation rearrangements are not an issue, then feel free to use the SN1 methods. If you need more control over your reactions and stereochemistry is important to you, then the SN2 method is what you need. At the end of the day, the choice is going to be based on the problem you're working on. So like in many tutorials where I'm talking about different reactions, I'll warn you against making blanket statements and just gravitating towards one or the other method just because you like it. Always analyze the molecule in front of you and make decisions based on your needs. Now, if you're still here, first of all, thank you for watching till the end. And as an extra bonus here, I have a challenge for you. How would you convert R1-phenylprop2-in1-all into 3 bromo 3 phenylprop one in retaining the configuration and keeping the double bond where it is? I'll give you a hint. You'll need to use a sequence of two different substitution reactions. Write your answer in the comments below. Remember to hit the like button if you like this video and learned something new today. Subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates. Watch this video next and I will see you tomorrow.